Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kim Barrett Show. I am your host, Kim Barrett. And on today's episode, we are joined by Mr. Harriet Spate. Now, if you're someone who's seen the movie Boiler Room, you've seen the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and you always wonder what's it been like to work in those sorts of uh, environments from a sales perspective, you're going to get a few little insights on that from Mr. Harry today. We dive into all of that sales, sales approach, what you need to be doing differently now that, uh, you know, obviously the last couple of years have been pretty hectic for businesses and how you should approach that differently from a sales perspective. And of course, if we can ever help you from a marketing perspective, just head over to our group, www.joinmygroup.com.au. We do free trainings for you every week on marketing, all that fun stuff and more, of course. But until then, let's jump into the show. Harry, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you making the time. Hey, it's awesome to be here, Kim. Coming from the US and speaking to the Aussie guy. This is really cool. I know. It's great to have. I always like my, uh, you know, what is it? The transatlantic, I don't know, whatever it is. The international calls. (laughs) Always good fun. Uh, I'm not sure how they run the cables all the way underwater and uh, stuff always fascinated me. But we don't have to get into that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not today. Another time, maybe. uh, (laughs) Exactly. Harry, I, I do like to always start the podcast off the same way every time, which is if I met you at a party and we were chatting away and I said to you, Harry, what is it that you actually do? What's your go-to answer? Um, do I have a few drinks in me at this point or at is least, this one? At, at least two drinks. At least two drinks. <laughs> okay. So I'm pretty comfortable with you at that point then. So what it is I do is I try to bring light to the world of sales that selling does not have to be a dirty, ugly, slimy thing, that people can do it with honor and feel good about it. So that's it in a nutshell. So I have to ask then, it's like, were you sold to by a dirty, slimy, sleazy salesperson? Like, <laughs> I've got to fix this? Or like, yeah. how, did, how did you, because uh, I always find it interesting with, I get to, being that we're in marketing, we speak to a lot of you know uh, sales uh, teachers, coaches, mentors and whatnot, just as a byproduct of what we do. And it's always mm-hmm. kind of interesting to hear about how they how they got them pushed into sales because most most of the time people want to do better, right? They want to kind of change how sales are perceived. So I'd love to know. Yeah. So I came into sales from a mission background. So I was uh, in missionary work for a number of years. And when I got into sales, I was uh, indoctrinated quickly into a corporate sales bullpen. So if you're familiar with movies like uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or The Boiler Room, any of those, that's where I was. So a few months earlier, I was a missionary riding around in a motorcycle, completely free to do what I want in a day, and then plunked into this room side by side with a bunch of other guys who were 10 years younger than me. I was not one that swore much. I mean, virtually not at all, right? Coming from the mission background, there's tons of F-bombs being dropped. And, you know, I just like, wow, this is uh, not what I anticipated, but I figured it out and stuck through it and uh, kind of changed the game as to the way I was going to approach sales. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> that's a standard I, I, I answer, like right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's like everyone It's like you have to like you have to be able to see, as you say, bring your light to it. You kind of obviously have to see the darkness of sales and like what the, <laughs> what that's like to be able to try and bring the light in, I suppose, because. I know for me, when I watch those, like watch those movies you mentioned and you see it and you're like, wow, like it's, and I think that as well can kind of position sales people in a bad, in a bad way, obviously. Um, yeah. But it, it's, uh, it's, it's rough because that's how people, they, that's the only way they thought that you could do sales at the time, I suppose. Right. So the uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Alan, Alec Baldwin line, always be closing, ABC, always be closing. And so people you know, just stomp all over. And that's, you know, so focused in their mind that they have to be closing. They forget all about like being a human and treating others with some kind of respect, you know? So anyway, that's just the, unfortunately that impacts all of us, even you, right? When you have to sell, uh, people view you probably in a way, I mean, you're great, but because of the impact of others on them, then, you know, they, 
they might look at you more like the other type of salespeople because that's what their experience has been. Is that true? Yeah, definitely. Um, a hundred percent. And it's, yeah. uh, I mean, look, the only thing I did take away as a positive from that movie is my ability when salespeople tell me the leads are weak because I do marketing. I'm just like, leads aren't weak. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only uh, that's, that's, you, yeah i, I that, love I it that. yeah <laughs> yeah that's a great i yeah, that is a great takeaway these yeah. leads are weak <laughs> jack lemon <laughs> spineless jack lemon stealing leads you know so it's great uh, yeah that, that's that's one of my favorites for sure but so what so so you're in the boiler room you're seeing like the intensity of this and you realize there's got to be something different like what what happened next for you where did you go from there yeah, so uh, it was writing a bunch of zeros. I mean, I don't know how you write zeros, but that was what they were writing next to my name every month. So this is a pretty depressing scenario, right? If so, we left the mission work, my wife and I, I was going to start providing for our new family. I was failing miserably in sales and this culture. And so if you're familiar, are you familiar with the book? Um, Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. Oh, yeah, great book. Yeah, okay. So he talks about sales in a way where it's coming from love, right? I will greet each day with love in my heart. So here I was, naive Harry, going into work. It's like, I'm going to love people. Sales is all about love. And it's like, what the F are you selling this month? It, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was, you know, it was intense, right? And I watched pe grown men cry is what you know that type of intensity because it's just that's just the way it was i'm not saying it was wrong it just wasn't my style so I, after i failed for a bunch of months um i was just thinking look i gotta make this work i mean my wife is working she's pregnant i'm not making any money this has got to work somehow and i just went back in my mind to look i know how to serve people I am not good in sales. I, uh, I didn't have any business acumen. I was you know, 35 years old and I came out of the mission field. So I had zero business acumen. I was selling printers uh, that, were, that ran around $50,000. So I, I didn't even know what people used them for. And I'm calling on companies. It's like, well, you know, this is the, like the twilight zone. So I said, you know, I'm just going to serve people and see where that takes me. And I, I committed to that. And I said, no, I'm just going to keep doing that. And so long story short, my first order, the person who was buying from me after we did this trial, test run and all this, their closing line to me was, Harry, what do we need to do to keep this thing? <laughs> so I was the anti-closer. Right? I let people close me. And, you know, it's like, when people say, well, what's your favorite clothes? It's like, I think it is when people ask me for the order. <laughs> Not when I ask them for the order. <laughs> How can I give you money today, Harry? <laughs> <Right>? Exactly. <laughs> Checks, money orders, cash app, I pay, Apple pay. You got it. All good. <laughs> but yeah, talk about uh, a person completely lost and out of place. That was me, but it, it all worked out. And so once, obviously, you st so you started making sales using your own kind of approach, I suppose. Um, yeah. Like what? Well, it was done before, but, you know, it was new to me. I knew to the arena I was in. And so how did you then, like, what was the, the steps from there? Because obviously, once you started, obviously, seeing success with it uh, and being able to be building, I suppose, a bit of repetition, like, how did you then try and uh, ad adopt that and kind of grow that even more? Yeah, uh, it's, this is really great. Um, so I was, I, I, there's a term for this, but it's unconscious, conscious, something like that. I don't know exactly how that's, uh, years ago we talked about that. I didn't know what I was doing. Let, I'll be completely honest. I just was applying a service mindset. So in my mind, introducing the product that was brand new to the market, um, I mean, who's no one's buying $50,000 color printers because, you know, that's not what people just say. You know, what? I need a 50,000. I, I need a color printer. I think my budget's 50 grand. This is in the day when color printers were they're expensive, but they're around a thousand or two thousand dollars back in the mid to late 90s, not 50. So I had to introduce the technology to people, but I did it in a way 
that I wanted to uncover what their problems were. So by uncovering their problems, I could talk about, hey, there's a better, there's better technology out there. And it was a very slow process. It was a slow sale. I mean, because you're introducing it and again, no one had budget for that. But the phone started to ring, you know, six to 18 months after I had these conversations with people. I'd bring their colors, print samples. But what I was doing was providing value. I was educating my market, so to speak. And I'm using the quotations because I wasn't educating the entire market, but I was educating. And I just stumbled across that. I mean, if you listen to uh, is Gary V big in uh, Australia, Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty yeah. big. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you listen to Gary V today, he talks about providing value. Just keep providing value and results will come. Well, I, there was no Gary, I mean, he was still a kid back then, right? But what I was doing was laying this foundation and seeding, you know, the marketplace, so to speak, by providing this value, unbeknownst to me that that's what I was doing. I just, it came naturally. But now looking back at that, I can say, well, that's what I did. And, you know, and I encouraged my team as when I got into sales leadership to do the same thing. Just keep... You know, just keep educating, right? Let people know that there's a better way that they don't have to do the same old, same old because someone told them that, right? And just provide the value through education. What's your thought on that? Look, I, I love that and wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I, But I know the question that will come into some people's mind when they listen to this, especially those business owners who are maybe a little bit newer or newer to sales, at least for their own business yeah. is going to be, well, how much how much education and value is too much? Like, is there a point where it's like, well, I've given away all my goodness that I would charge people for? Like, how do you balance that in the sales process? Yeah, I get that that's a concern. But if it's knowledge, I mean, take it from a person who has done sales leadership for 20 years, right? I could tell sales reps what to do, when to do it, how often to do it, what to say. They didn't remember 10 minutes after the conversation. Right, because then they would go after out of the conference room role play. They go on the phone. It's like, did we just have this conversation? <laughs> right. So people don't remember. So if you're worried that people are going to remember everything and they're going to know all your secrets, I mean, come on. People have other things on their mind, and whatever the uh, percentage of people, what they hear from us and what they remember, it's. Within a couple of hours, it drops down dramatically. Next day, it's almost zero. And then, you know, a week or two later, it's gone, right? So don't worry about that. I mean, if, you're, if you have inside secrets or something that's new to the market, I'm not saying to give that out, but provide the value so that people can make educated decisions, right? So like an example and tell me if i'm talking too much because you know i'm all wired up here uh, <laughs> but like uh, realtors i can't tell you how boring realtors insurance agents and financial planners are if you ever talk to any of these people they will say i'm a financial planner or i'm a realtor or i sell insurance okay well you've done nothing for me personally so what can you do? And just telling me what you do brings no real attraction. I'm not attracted just because you say what you do. Start educating, start providing value. You know, share some insight. What it, how you buy homes today, right? How do you get ahead of the market? What do you look for? What about resales what, versus new? There's all kinds of things that people can talk about and educate their clients and prospects, but they don't. They just say things like, if you ever need a financial planner, yeah, you know, here's my card. It's like, you know, and that goes right in the trash because you provided zero value. Is that similar to what you're seeing? A hundred percent. Yeah. I was going to, so for, for the people listening and like, I, I, I don't know what it is around where people kind of feel like they, again, maybe they're feeling salesy or they're just not confident in the delivery of that when someone's asking it and kind of go into it. Is there a, non that's the right way of saying this like a non-intrusive way of saying like of how you help or providing value in that short little like in your you know your little intro pitch um, yeah 
like, is there a, is there an easy way to do it where you're like, well, I feel like I'm not overstepping and going into sales mode when I'm meeting this person at a conference or an event or a party or something like that. Yeah. I, yeah, I totally get it. And, uh, you know, the pitch is very boring. I am against the pitch. I'm anti-pitching, um, because we use the pitch like everyone is the same. Mm. And right, so if you're talking to someone who is whatever, uh, a potential buyer versus someone who is never going to buy your stuff, wouldn't you speak to them differently? Right. And so one, you might give a 30,000 foot overview. Another one, you might give a 100,000 foot overview. Or you could ask a question and I like this approach and you say, do you know how people struggle with marketing and they never know if their marketing dollars are being put to good use? And people who are in business will say, yeah, that's a problem. You say, I help solve that problem. And just leave it at that. And it's like, and then if people don't say, tell me more, they're not interested, right? You, I mean, they're from you know, my mission field, I've learned that uh, don't throw your pearls before swine. And not that people are swine, don't take that the wrong way. Any listeners, I'm not calling people swine, but don't waste your breath is another way of saying that. Because what you're doing is that you're just going to alienate the person and, you know, because you're talking when they're not interested, right? And that just, it's sort of, you know, it's just like at the conversation at the bar, right? You ask someone a simple question and then they go on and talk about all the problems in their life and it's like, oh, geez, uh, wait, way too much information. I was just being polite, right? <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Yeah, sometimes people use that as the excuse to, yeah, just regurgitate everything uh, yeah. <laughs> on top of someone. Um, rather yeah, because than- they have a live one, yeah. right? Because yeah. the person was polite and they think, well, here's my opportunity. I've got a live one and I just got to, if the more I talk and don't breathe, right, the more I get out, then the less they can say, look, I'm really not interested. <laughs> You know, so we eliminate that by talking a lot, sort of like what I'm doing now. But I'm wired. It's 9 p.m. Eastern, so you know, it's yeah, what it you is. have a good excuse. It's all right. It's all yeah. right. I want you to. I want you to go that way. <laughs> That's fine. And so, okay. how have you? What about over like the last couple of years? Being that everything's kind of been turned on its head around the world, crazy things going on. Have you seen? Um, the sales process or approach people need to implement change. Obviously, there's there's providing value, which is probably you know <clears> really <throat> a, like stands against the test of time forever to do. But has there been anything that you've noticed that's need to change over the last yeah. couple of years? Yeah, I think the a couple of things. Number one is we have to be way more empathetic. I mean, I come from that background. I always felt like I was empathetic, but you, you know, you got to be a lot more empathetic because some businesses are really struggling. Others are doing great and you've got to understand the difference, right? Some people are still in buying mode. They're crushing it and they want everything to be great and the best technology, whatever it is you sell. And others are like, look, we're just going to see if we can make it through the next couple of years because we were destroyed financially over the last two years. Right. So having conversations going beyond the how's business, right? What, what did you learn? Right. What are some of the things that you learned in business or about business or about, you know, the volatility of the economy over the past couple of years that you feel that you benefit from and just get people talking about that and see if they open up and give you some kind of clues. Uh, some are rare to go. It's like, and they'll say that that's all, that's all behind me. We're crushing it. It's like, okay, now, you know, that tells you something versus someone who is very, you know, down and discouraged. And there's a lot of, I don't knows and uncertainties in the conversation. Right. So salespeople in general, don't pick up on this stuff because they're all talking about product and service and how great they are. They don't really care in general about the prospect. So the person like you and other small business owners that are in sales mode, if you just take that little advice and say, let me have better conversations and empathize with people and see where their head's at before I start 
trying to sell something to them. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I would say 100. percent It's and it's the same because yeah, there's so many people where it's not even the next. They're like just trying to get through the next three, few months, you know, and then they're just like right. So you have to you have to kind of have that uh, empathy and leniency 100. percent And uh, it's uh, it's yeah. been crazy for a year. So if you if you've made it this far as a business owner anyway, probably pat yourself on the back. And, uh, well, it's and still scary with the, with the supply chain. Mm. So, you know, because companies, the, the challenge with supply chain for people that don't know is that companies that have a ton of cash flow, they're not really impacted as much. But the smaller businesses that depend on the supply chain, right? If they're selling widgets that are coming from Asia, and they don't have cash flow and they have employees, right? So they've got orders, they can't fulfill, so they're not getting paid and their employees, guess what? They want to collect a check every week or every two weeks. So that whole thing, guess, guess what the priority is for the business owner? It ain't buying. It's how do I make payroll or I'm worried about making payroll for another six months. I might have a little bit reserved, but they, they want to hold on to the cash just so that they can, you know, feel good about the orders coming in and actually being fulfilled, right? Because people are ordering, but they're not being fulfilled in the same level as they were prior to this stuff. Yeah. And, even, and even just the um, supply chain and the, and the pricing of goods. So my uh, partner has a cafe cooking oil, which comes from, um, you know, the, the Russia, Ukraine region to things like that. Yeah. Prices have tripled. Um, yeah. and you know, and it's like, you were already scraping by before that. And now you have to deal with, yeah. deal with the, that price increase. Like it's, um, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so we all have to, I mean, this is another opportunity to be empathetic and realize like, how much do we ask for the business? Right. I don't say push because I'm not about pushing, but you ask politely and ask for the follow up time and so forth. But, you know, peep every day in the news. Right. I choose not to watch the news except for maybe two minutes to see if the war ended. The war hasn't ended. I don't spend any time. Right. Because it's just super discouraging. But so, you know, prices are going to keep going up. Right. And there's all these challenges with fuel deliveries, supply chain, and people are worried about, you know, what is this going to mean for my 18 year old son or daughter? Uh, so all of this is going on and we show up and say, Hey, do you want to buy my stuff? Uh, you know, it's just, we're so out of sync that it just, it's not logical. So we really have to get in the zone where people are and come from that place and see if we can have conversations and learn and understand and kind of understand that our pipeline in sales might be what once was 90 days might be six to 12 months or longer. Right. But we still, we can still lay the groundwork. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Now, Harry, I could probably sit and speak to you about this sort of stuff for, uh, for many, many hours, but I want to make sure I stay on, uh, on time here. I always like to ask a question as we get towards the end of our time together, which is, is there a question which I haven't asked you, which I should have? Oh, man, you put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Now I've got to think. Uh, let's see. What was the funniest, dumbest thing I've ever done in my life? Uh, you didn't ask that. What's the craziest experience in sales? You didn't ask that. What is one thing I regret in sales? Ooh. I mean, there's, there's let's all go, kinds let's go of... Let's go with that one. What's, okay. Like that one. Yeah. All right. So something I regret in sales is trying to fit in with others. So there was a period of time where I was in a new company. So I started out in sales, kind of making progress. I went to a new company and I tried to fit in and it wasn't who I was. And what I learned, you know, I struggled again. So I went through the struggling when I started and I re had, had to go through this whole thing again. And I tried to be you know, someone other than who I was, which is coming from a place of service, you know, because I learned a few things. It's probably a little cocky going into a new company. And I just got a bunch of humble pie. And, you know, that that's that's something I look back at and say, what a dope I was for, you know, 
just give and it, it made a year terrible right because it, it impacts your income and it made it the year terrible and i probably could have gotten canned uh thankfully the owner of the company saw something more valuable and that i had potential or something but you know it wasn't a good move so you know the value the thing is is that you've got to stick to what your core values are right and in spite of pressure and so forth and if you compromise in any business then you can suffer so since then well there's there are periods there are moments right but in general, I mean, I really stuck to the uh, core values. Yeah, that's perfect. No, I love that. And now, Harry, for anyone that's been listening, if they go, look, I want to find out more about what Harry's up to and, and more about what he does, where's the best place for them to connect with you online? Well, I'm recently out of prison, so you don't have to look in prison anymore. Uh, actually, bad failed attempts at humor. I'm known for those. Um, so they can find me, you can actually Google selling with dignity. It's this book I wrote, um, and that will direct them to me, uh, on my website, Harry Spate and the spelling is weird. So we don't have to get into that, but selling with dignity is pretty easy and find me on LinkedIn. Um, I like to provide valuable content and, you know, I'm not worried about giving away free information. I want the world to be better economically i want people to thrive in their businesses so i'm going to provide value uh for free uh as long as i'm alive so uh and maybe some bad jokes too amazing love that so guys wherever you're watching listening reading this um check the show notes above or below we'll have all the links to harry's sites and you can and connecting with him on linkedin and all that fun stuff and if you know anyone who's maybe been hitting up against some hurdle in sales where they haven't really been able to make it click for themselves please do share this episode get this into their ears so they can find out uh maybe a few other ways that they could approach things rather than the old traditional uh boiler room uh, approach that they may have been doing in the past harry again yeah, thank you so I much for joining us really appreciate you making the time yeah, it's awesome. I love your energy, Kim. So that's why it got me uh, fired up this evening. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking to you soon.